July 3rd, 1985. So everybody knows I, I start with a date. What happened that day? July 3rd, 1985, a movie premiered that captured hearts and minds around the world. The story begins with a disappointed teenager who lives in a suburban home with his depressed, alcoholic mother, his adult siblings who are prof professional and social failures. They live at home too. And his beat down father who's bullied by his boss at work. Raised in an environment filled with depression, despondency, and discontent, the young man confides in his girlfriend that despite his, his hopes and his ambitions, he fears becoming just like his parents. He wants to make something of himself, but his present circumstances are a screaming reminder that the blessed life he desires might just be a dream out of reach. This young man finds escape in his guitar, his music, his rock and roll. And in his eccentric friend's time machine that was built out of a DeLorean automobile. Of course, the young man is Marty McFly, and the movie is Back to the Future. And if you haven't seen it, my gosh, go watch the thing. <laughs> One of my favorite movies of all time. In the story, Marty travels back to 1955 and meets up with a teenage version of his parents. And he discovers that alterations in his parents' actions and responses in their 1955 present, well, it creates big changes in the outcome of his 1985 reality. Like Marty, Many of us have found ourselves born into situations that were less than ideal. And we saw the outcome of our parents and wondered if, if we had any ability to avoid repeating it all. Isn't that the way? We might be in a terrible situation, but we're, we're almost bound to repeat it because this is the example that we've been given. And yet, we long for a better way. Is there a way to transcend the hand that we've been dealt and make a better life for ourselves and those that come after us? Is there a way to live a blessed life? Well, today we're beginning a new sermon series called Blessed Generation. And we will be looking at how making positive changes in our present circumstances can produce an outcome of blessing that impacts the future. Our base text is Psalm 112. Now we're not sure who wrote this psalm. It could have been King David. David led Israel in, in their golden years and he wrote so many of the psalms. But it doesn't say, there's no notation. But let's look at it and you can read along with me on the Sky Bible on the screen behind me. Psalm 112, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Look at that. People that are in this generation of the upright, even when they go through troubling times, even though it is dark in circumstance, light dawns for them. Because they have a perspective that goes beyond the here and now, and they see the end with God from his perspective. And if they don't see it, they trust in him at least and find their hope anchored there. Everything that we struggle with, all of the hurts, all of the darkness, all of the, the difficulties, it passes. 
there comes to an end at some point, and there comes a day when, we're, when it's behind us, when it's in our past. Verse 5, it says, Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their fa- affairs with justice. Now, we don't lend to everybody without discretion. We're stewards of what's been given us, and, we, and the need is beyond our ability to, to handle. But we give freely as the Lord directs, and this is crucial. Rather than doing something that is trying to win the favor of God, we, we do something to work with God in what he's doing in the lives of people around us. And when we give and when we lend, we do so because the Holy Spirit that we've come to recognize, that voice within us that we don't hear with our ears, when he says, I'm working in this person's life, lend to them, give to this one, then we respond to that. But not necessarily everybody that comes at you. But we work with him according to his plan, stewarding what belongs to him rightly anyway. And we do so with justice, never turning a sharp corner, never taking an easy path, never doing something that's inappropriate, always being upright. Verse 6 says, Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting the Lord. Again, the perspective of heaven in our situation helps us to see beyond the here and now. I'm reminded of a man who who wrote in this one book how he was both a ship captain and a pilot. And he was... He was on Lake Michigan, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Great Lakes. They are enormous. The, it's, the word lake doesn't even capture the size and immensity of these. Large tanker ships sink in these and are gone. You can't find them. Ju- they just disappear. This, these lakes are so enormous, so mammoth, that you can't see across, you can't see the other side. You look left, right, and across, and it's just endless water, although it's fresh water. Now this man, he was uh, one that would sail in, in a competitive sense with a team, and yet one person from the team for each race would have to go and get the boat and deliver it to the starting location where the race would begin. And he recalls taking that, that boat and taking it across Lake Michigan when a storm hits. And like this, the stories in the scripture when the, storm hit the lake, when the storm hit the Sea of Galilee, this captain, this guy, was terrified. Bigger than, than the Sea of Galilee by far. He thought he would be swallowed up in Lake Michigan, pushing along alone, sailing it in the midst of that storm with the waves rising and falling. But he said there was a different perspective when he was in his aircraft, little one, you know, just a puddle jumper kind of thing, but it would go across from one side to the other, maybe from the Michigan side to, to Illinois or back or forth, whatever the case. When he was there and a storm came on the same lake and his eyes were looking from above, Well, he could see the end from his present location. Not so in the boat. Not down at that lower perspective, that lower vantage point, he could not see what was in front of him. He could not expect how long it would be. But the vantage point of heaven, the vantage point of the sky, allowed him to see and to have and retain hope. And he was able to sail above the difficulty It didn't have the same reach. It didn't have the same effect in his life. And those that put their hope in God, they do not fear bad news, although bad news comes, doesn't it? 
but it's a, a matter of who we trust in and where our perspective is and how we're carried through it. And, what, and if our perspective is only this life and the here and now, we're not seeing to the other side. We have to see beyond. Verse eight, their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn, or strength, will be lifted high in honor. Verse 10 is a, takes a different view here. It says the wicked, in contrast, will see and be vexed or perplexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. So what do we see in this text that suggests how we can overcome the negative effects of the past and present and discover blessings that carry on? Point number one, blessed are those who fear the Lord. What does verse one mean by fear? Fear the Lord, what is that? When we consider who God is and compare ourselves with him, we, we see how awesome and powerful and holy he is. That's a sharp contrast. We also see we are not like him. He's beyond definition of, of sorts. We have little glimpses in the, into the attributes of who he is, but this is a God who is not affected by the material universe. He's not affected by time. He stands outside of them. He was the one that created them. He existed. They did not. He made them so, and here we are. How big is God? How do you quantify that? How powerful is a God who can make material appear, that ball of mass that becomes the Big Bang? Who made the bang, if not the banger, right? Who is this God? How powerful is he? And how different is he? How holy is he? And when we see that, we can become overwhelmed. I mean, if I were to lock you up in a, in a cage with a, with a silverback gorilla, I think you would have a measure of respect and reverence for this. We might call that even fear. And if that doesn't do it, we'll ramp it up with some other animals that are a little terrifying and larger than you, right? But that's only a, a small understanding of what we're talking about. God is so big. And to one degree, we should have this measure of respect for what God can do to those who oppose or anger him. Because we have accounts in the Old Testament that reflect when somebody opposes God, a created being that he made goes against him, the creator, he takes exception. And like Evan Almighty, makes things happen. I won't go there. Different movie. I was actually thinking of Bruce Almighty. Smite me, almighty smiter. He was bringing on the wrath of God, a crazy man. Yet there is another sense of the word fear that we prefer to focus on, and that is that we revere, that we marvel at who he is and what he is capable of. He is without limit, all-powerful. And the blessings come when we hold these two ideas in tandem and avoid the pride of superimposing ourselves in his place as our own Lord. We don't do a good job filling his shoes. Blessed are those who fear the Lord. Point number two. Blessed are those who find great delight in his commands. Verse 1 goes on to say that finding great delight in God's commands leads to blessing. Time and again, I'll keep making mention of this, but our learning how to be in the word of God 
gives him opportunity to speak into our lives. Yes, the creation testifies to who he is. And yes, the heavens declare his glory by observation. But there's something unique and special about the word of God. And when we dive into that, he speaks to us. But you know what I've never found in, at all? When God speaks to us, our response is never, oh, that was interesting. He's never talking to us just to merely inform us or to entertain us. Every time God speaks, he speaks so that he directs. There's something that he wants us to do for our own good, always. And if we understand what God said, then we're left with a decision to either respond appropriately or not. We have this decision before us, time and again. Maybe ignorance is bliss and we don't read the Bible, and yet the pain and of external cir circumstances speaks loudly. Remember I talked about God being a potter. And you're clay. You and I are clay. We're, we're, we need to be moldable. We need to be able to be shaped. And God speaks to us and shapes us with external circumstances and internal pressures. If we won't dive into his word, if we won't know him that way, he'll become known through these other things, these other tools at his disposal. We will not understand what's happening to us when those external pressures are happening, when the difficulties of life come. We will misread and misunderstand and lose hope and maybe make some reaction that isn't in line with his will, that leads us toward self-inflicted pain. When we don't read his word, we're not understanding, then we're deceiving ourselves, believing our own thoughts, and buying into lies that come at us time and again. But, but, those that find delight in his commands, well, they're the ones that also obey his commands. When we read his word, revelation takes place. And revelation leads to a, a demand for response. And when we respond according to his will, then we find delight because we are testing and approving what his will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. It's a blessing. Now this psalm that I read talked about all kinds of blessing. And honestly, it would be a prosperity preacher's dream text. It's so full of good stuff that you can name and claim and all like that. And it feels a little bit awkward for, for us that try to stand and distance ourselves from, from those type of, of preachers and people. A very self-centered theology oftentimes. And yet, our God being a good God really does bless us, really does desire to do so really wants to put you in a good place, on a good path, with a, a, a life that leads to hope. And I hate to say it, but yes, prosperity. Why not? As a parent, isn't this what you want for your children? To put them on a path of prosperity? And you know how the name it and claim it go game goes with your child. They name it, they claim it, and you say no. Right? But the good stuff that they really need and some of the stuff you, that they want, you provide that for them. Because if you're a good parent, you're, you're dealing with them according to their needs. What does it mean to find great delight in his commands? So this is the focus. Not on the outcomes. Not on the outcomes, but on the instructions and expectations of the Lord our God. That's the thing. We know that when we obey, we're blessed. But our focus can't remain on that point. We cannot stay focused on the fact that blessing comes through obedience and let that be our primary motivator for our responses. We have to delight ourselves in Him 
wanting to please him through the obedience to his instructions. It's about getting the cart and the horse in the right order. And when you delight in his commands, you are agreeing with his commands. We obey in agreement, not in opposition. We agree with his commands and we are applying them in practice. This is how we delight in him. We delight in the result that comes because we see that his ways work, even though his ways are contrary to our instinct. I mean, the money thing that I brought up earlier. When God says, give 10% of your income, your instinct is, how will I pay my bills? When he says to forgive someone, our instinct is, they don't deserve it. All of the instructions of God seem to be counterintuitive. They're the opposite of what our natural inclinations are. And yet, when we are prompted through his word and prompted through the Holy Spirit's voice in us to do and respond in certain ways, we find delight. Because these things that seem counterintuitive, suddenly we realize they work. And it's amazing. When you delight in his commands... You're agreeing with his commands. The delight comes from a recognition that all his precepts are right and they lead to life. Point number three, the generation of the upright will be blessed. That's what it says. The generation of the upright. In verse two, it says the children of will be mighty in the land. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be great in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. And so I was pondering that and wondering, who is that referring to, this generation of the upright? They're the ones getting blessed. Is that the parents or the children? Where does that factor in? I'm not understanding. And then it occurred to me that it's those that put their trust in Jesus. More than anything, I want to be in that blessed generation, for sure. And I want to see that the blessings that I have received will extend to those that come after me. Now, if we look at the genealogies that are in the Bible, those, those boring places that you quickly skip when you're, when you're reading the Bible, you're like, whoop, whoop, this chapter today is a full genealogy. I don't have to read it. Bada bing. Flip the page, check the box, and go off on your way, right? How hard is it to read those names? And would you dare naming your child that? It's crazy. But when you look at these generations you see something. Most of the genealogies are named for the greatest person in the list. And usually their name is at the top. It's at the beginning. It's the genealogy of Abraham or David or someone else. And they're, they're naming that person first. And the listing you know, of those that would come after is there. But when we get to the New Testament, the book of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus. And yet in this list, Jesus is listed last. However, we know that Jesus is absolutely, without a doubt, the greatest name on that genealogical record. Because he precedes all. He's eternal. He was before. Nothing existed without him. He made everything. He was instrumental in this whole process. And he became a man in order to show us the way to salvation. An old story, I've told it before, but worth repeating, is the story of a farmer who goes out into his field in a cold winter day and sees a flock of birds circling. And they are so cold and they can't figure out where to go 
to get out of the danger, to find safety, to find warmth. And the farmer's heart is filled with compassion for these poor birds. And he thinks to himself, if only I could help them. And he thinks, well, I've got a barn and it's warmer than it inside than outside. Let me open those doors. So he does that. He opens the doors to that barn so that they might go in. And he watches the birds and they continue to circle aimlessly. And he tries to motion toward the barn. And then he thinks, well, maybe they're afraid of me. So he goes away from the barn. No matter what he does, these birds, they're not going in to the place of safety and warmth. And finally, in futility, the farmer thinks to himself, I would first have to become a bird in order to show them the way to safety and warmth. And this is what Jesus did. He became God. The Son of God became one of us so that he could communicate with us so that we would understand and some of us might respond appropriately and follow him. God is so good. Jesus is above all. The Son of God, listed in the genealogy in the book of Matthew, at the end of the genealogy, is by far the greatest in that list. And the genealogical record doesn't reflect any names after his. We don't see any names after him. Obviously, we know he, he wasn't married, he didn't have children, he didn't do any of that. And yet, we have the opportunity to be included into his family. And the thing about genealogies is, is it, it lists people who've come and who've gone, who've died. But yet he remains. As Jesus is alive and eternal, he represents a generation that remains. And all those who align with him through faith in him as Lord and Savior, well, they're part of a generation that will not fade. Blessed is the generation of the upright, those whose righteousness is attained through faith in Jesus will be blessed. And we also see in Psalm 112 that those who are blessed possess attributes that are focused on serving the needs of others. The blessed are, as the, as the psalm has declared, they're gracious. They're compassionate, they're generous, and they're just toward others. Jobert, I want to ask you to come and play on the keyboard. And I'm going to bring this message to its conclusion, and then we are going to worship God by remembering Jesus' sacrifice through communion. I'll let the band stay as they are right now, just sobered up here for right this moment. We look at our present, we think about our past, and we wonder about our future. And if a time machine really existed, many of us would want to use it to go back in time to fix the mistakes that we've made, to undo the sins that we've committed. We would try to correct those wrongs and sins that have led to pain and brokenness, both in ourselves and in others. And we would look for a way to change the outcomes that have brought us to this point. We would look for a way beyond that leads to hope and expectation. We, also, we would also want to see our present circumstances altered and our life looking more like the blessed life that we've heard about. Sometimes I wish there was a time machine. And then when I reflect on this thought, I think, well, geez, 
Even the mistakes have been useful in God's hands. Even the temptations that I struggled with but now learn to overcome are useful in God's shaping. Even the bad stuff that I was born into and the things that I've done, God can turn it all around. He's amazing. There's no real time machines that I know of. But we do have a way to affect change in the present and to alter the future. Jesus being Lord of all creation is eternal and he, he not only created this material universe, he created time. And when you fix your eyes on Jesus, when you delight in him and his commands, you will find that the transformation that he can bring through your faith, through your obedience, well, it will set your past, your present, and future in order. And you will remain as a member of the generation of the upright by putting your trust and your faith in him. If you haven't yet decided to trust in Jesus for salvation, but you're ready to do so, now's the time. If you want to find the blessings that come with faith in him, then pray with me. Father, I recognize that I had nothing to do with being born, being alive, and having all of the things that I have, my personality, my abilities, my skills. I had nothing to do with where I was born, nor did I have anything to do with which family that I was born into. I don't understand everything about my origin. I don't understand the why but I've come to understand who you are. You're a big God, and you're all powerful. And though I have disappointed you through my sins, through my mistakes, through my pride, you're willing to forgive me of my sins. And yet you are a just God, and that's for sure. We find that Jesus satisfies the penalty of my sins by taking the punishment that should have been for me onto himself. I'm truly amazed, God. And when I read about blessings, I want them. When I read about life that has purpose and meaning, and specifically that my life would have purpose and meaning, God, I want that. If all I have to do is trust in you, Jesus, and to the best of my ability, with your enablement, follow you, and you'll give me all this, then I want that. God, I pray, give me that. I choose to trust in you, Jesus. I choose to put my faith in what I, my eyes haven't seen specifically, but I've come to believe that you died for my sins and the sins of the whole world. And if I'll just put my trust in you and follow you, blessings come. God, I pray, receive me into your family, that I might be with you, that I might have a life that goes beyond this one, that I might live forevermore with you. God, receive me, just as I receive your free gift of salvation, Lord, in Jesus' name. And if you have already trusted in Jesus, but you have found that your reverence, your delight in him are lacking, 
and you want to see the fullness of what it means to be blessed, then pray with me. Father God, you know that man is fallible. You know that I make mistakes. You know that I'm easily distracted. And you know that sometimes my desires, well, they're blown about like a wave of the sea, tossed to and fro. And sometimes my focus really isn't on you. It centers back on myself sometimes. The busyness of life and the distractions and the things that come at me, they often pull my attention, my focus away from you. I don't read my word when, as often as I should, nor do I apply what I'm reading, but I just let my eyes glaze over as I cover the page. God help me. If you are God, if you are eternal before all things, if you made the material universe and you want my attention, what other thing is of greater importance? I'm sorry. God, I pray that you would minister in my life and help me to focus on the stuff that really matters, to zero in on you, to be able to hear your voice through your word, through circumstance, through other people, through the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray, lead me in my habits. Help me to prioritize you. And God, I pray, pour out a blessing that I cannot contain. But God, I pray that you would change my heart to be like Jesus, that I would live a life of sacrifice and giving, where the blessing to me is routed through me to others so that your will is done. God, I pray, be glorified through my life now. In Jesus' name.